<laughs> All right. Okay, Casey. Okay, so. Hey, the bouncing flower was not invited. Okay, sorry, that's that whole YouTube thing. Well, all right, well, I didn't get to do my poll, so there's that's not going to happen. Okay, and she's back. So we have, oh, my daughter's on. Hi. Hello, my daughter, my videographer, aerospace engineering daughter's on. Oh, yay. Wow. Yay. Yay to the daughter. Yep. Um, oh, God. All right, let's see. We have 40 seconds and counting. We're going live on YouTube. Okay, so I will get um, my PowerPoint up. And I will. Up. I'm going to turn my share my screen. Airplane mode on. <laughs> You're already dancing. Come and get your seeds. <laughs> and play some start. Okay. I'll give it a little more time. Everybody. Oh, how lovely. Gotta be kidding me. Okay, so that even though we can only see the three of us, there are several more people on. So behave, girls. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about the pollinator pathway, the green corridor, and the ecotype project. Turn on panels. What does that even mean, Jean? Um, and I am Mary Hogue. I am the chair of the Fairfield Forestry Committee. And um, in Fairfield, that's the lead organization for the um, pollinator pathway. So I'm going to be talking to you about that. So what is the pollinator pathway? It's um, corridors of public and private spaces that uh, provide native plant habitat and nutrition for our pollinators. And oh, there's where I go. So it provides uh, little stepping stones for our pollinators to get from one place to the next and allows the place the pollinators to get uh, to pesticide free healthy yards and spaces. And why would we need to do that? Why create a pathway here? Well, if you look at the left side, you can see that pretty much looks like suburbia where we are. So we want to make sure that we um, take these fragmented areas and make the pollinators give them a place where they can um, get to where they, um, I'm sorry, I've got to do my little timer, um, can get from one spot to the next. And um, so many of our spaces are owned by private uh, citizens so uh, who love their lawn. So we wanna make sure that we don't have nothing but lawn, but we have at least some small spot that the pollinators can come visit. So you can have it in a small container, you can have a garden, you can have a big land trust, or perhaps we can get a pollinator garden in all our schools, maybe even a big giant space. And we'll hear more about that from Mel. So this started locally in 2016, and we've actually now in 2020, I think we're over 95 towns in Connecticut and New York. We're three counties in New York and in Fairfield County in Connecticut. So Fairfield, yay! is one of the many towns in the pollinator pathway in the Northeast. So you, if you wanna find out more about the pollinator pathway here, you wanna to go to pollinator-pathway.org. Each town has its own pathway page. So that's right here. The events are listed for all towns. And as you might imagine, all events have been canceled for the foreseeable future. This is one of the few that we are holding lately. Um, there are yard signs available in Fairfield. They're available at the Connecticut Audubon at Burr Street and Wild Bird Unlimited when they're open. Um, if you go to the pollinator-pathway 
org website, you can order them there and I guess they can mail them to you. Um, we share resources. Um, we have a steering committee for all those 95 towns where we share our handouts, best practices about removing invasives, tips for planting and so forth. Um, so why, why do we wanna do this? There are a couple of really scary statistics. The monarch populations are down 90% in the last 20 years. The West Coast monarch population last year or will, will have, were down 97% since 1981. Last year, they were down incredibly uh, in the West Coast. For the East Coast, it actually was a pretty good year the last couple of years. Um, bumblebee decline has been considerable. Um, even in Europe, it's not just happening in North America, it's happening all over. Uh, we often, we talk about how in the good old days when we were kids, you used to have all these yellow splotches all over your uh, windshield after you'd go for a long drive. We don't have that anymore with, because the bugs aren't there to be getting hit. Uh, not that we want to have that anymore. We don't want to hit the poor bugs, but um, they just don't exist anymore. And what are the threats? Well, there's climate change. One of the big theme, the theme for this year's Earth Day is climate change. And um, obviously COVID is a theme that everyone's talking about this year, but climate change, COVID will, will come and go. Climate change is with us and we need to remember that. And what can we do to address that? We can certainly stop using pesticides and lawn chemicals. There's no reason for it. We really don't need all those lawns. We can do lawn replacements that are just as easy um, on the eyes, just as wonderful uh, to walk on, and certainly a lot easier to maintain. We can um, defragment and we can um, have more habitat for our insects. So instead of having a loss and fragmentation of habitat, we can do the opposite. We can connect those habitats. There's light pollution. There's no reason to keep your lights on at night. When you're home and you're going to bed, turn your lights off. Those, those moths that um, are attracted to the light, they die. They don't need, we don't need to do that. We confuse the birds that um, fly at night. So we need to, shift. oh, sorry. Um, uh -huh. I'm sorry, I have to shift someone to, I can't do that right now. Uh, please hold, we're having a technical issue. I can't. Uh, okay, hold on one second. Ignore the person behind the screen. <laughs> How do I get down to, oh my gosh, this is so frustrating. I can't, I thought Jean was a panelist. I can't get to that particular part of Zoom. I'm, uh, I think I have to stop sharing. No, I don't have to stop sharing. Why can't I get to that? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. There, that's why. Um, Jean, 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 Jean. So Jean uh, Stets-Polchowski is uh, the lead in Easton for the pollinator pathway and she has graciously offered to be our moderator. So she's not gonna be on video, but she is going to be on audio. And I forgot to mention that we will be taking questions as we go. So um, uh, that's why she wanted me to stop and um, she's monitoring the chat or she will be now that she's panelist. Sorry, sorry about that. So we'll go back to sharing. Come on now. Be nice. Ay caramba, I tell you. Um, share, 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 share. So um, the story of two dogwoods, this is the one that really sold us in Fairfield uh, because Fairfield's um, uh, town tree and symbol is the dogwood. We are renowned for having the dogwood festival for many years. Um, so there are two dogwoods. There's the native dogwood, which is the Cornus Florida which supports an entire food web. And the host is the spring azure butterfly, which is this beautiful little guy over here. And this is a dogwood twig and it has this lovely 
white um, sort of reflective thing right here. It's similar to this caterpillar that has this white reflective little stripe on it as well. And the dogwood has um, these lovely berries in the fall, which is a wonderful food source for birds. So it has all sorts of food sources. It has the leaves for the um, caterpillars in the spring. And then these lovely little things here in the spring turn into these lovely little red things that the birds eat in the fall. Whereas the Japanese dogwood, the Kusa dogwood, and you'll notice never has any leaves eaten. And it has these lovely little red berries. They, they look like little spiky balls that fall down underneath the tree. And because as you imagine, has all these um, flowers, they all turn into having a fruit and they all land on the, on the sidewalk or under the tree. And then of course, the, this monkey that we see all over Fairfield County eats them right up, right? Everybody's seen these <laughs> all over Fairfield County, right? Right, Mel? You have them all over. Yes, right? absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, this is not really helping our food web because the monkeys are only in its native range in Japan. So, um, it, it, we would prefer if you want to plant a dogwood that you would plant the native Cornus Florida. So, the other thing that you might consider is that. Um, having grass is fun you know it's great to have some grass you want to be able to run around and kick the ball around or throw you know your football or your baseball but you don't need every part of your property that isn't your house to be lawn um, the biggest crop in america is not what you think it is the biggest crop is lawn um, and there's different kinds of grasses so Part of the reason that you have to spend so much time tending to the grass that we use for our lawn is that this is our lawn grass. These are native grasses. So when you have a native grass and there's not much rain coming, it has all this root that can keep track of the water that's gone down, way down, and, and it can stretch and get nutrients and water that aren't accessible because it hasn't rained very much. Our lawn has to keep getting watered every time there's no rain coming, it has to get watered almost every day. It also has no way of getting any nutrients because it can't reach down. So it really is very, very needy. There's, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't want to take care of anybody so needy myself. So try and think of other ways that you can uh, get something on your property that isn't so needy. And it, again, takes an awful lot of water. And water is a finite source. The same water that we have this year, what the dinosaurs had, you know, there's just a finite amount of water. It's a closed system. So in Lower Fairfield County, 40% of the water is used outdoors. And it jumps up to 70% according to our water system. So we really need to be mindful in um, our world of what water we use and how we use it. So there are ways we can continue to use our, our current grass as uh, the lawn that we use, but we don't need to mow as often. We need to mow higher and we, therefore we can mow less frequently. And that will also mean that you won't have as many weeds. Um, so you'll have the, the lawn that you're looking for. You also can add different things to kind of encroach into your lawn. So you add shrubs and uh, evergreens and trees and uh, perennials so that you don't have as much lawn to mow, which gives you more time to do the fun things that you wanna do. And let part of your yard go natural. Give it a little uh, meadow or something that when it's the pollinators come and enjoy being with you, then pull up a chair and watch the show. It's a lot of fun. And don't use pesticides. It's not good for you. It's not good for the pollinators. It's poison. That's what it really is. It's trying to kill things. So believe me, you don't wanna be near it. That's what those yellow signs are all about. And uh, before you use anything, test your soil. As a master gardener, that's the first thing we always tell you before you apply anything, make sure you need it. If you don't need it, don't use it. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of um, time and it's a waste of resources. And for instance, leave the leaves. That's something that, that's a, a free fertilizer and a free mulch. So um, 
one of the things that we're trying to encourage people to do is instead of putting your garden to bed in the uh, fall, leave it. Let it stay there all winter long. It's a habitat. It's a food source. Um, it's uh, protecting your garden so that uh, the seeds will go back into the soil and they'll come back even stronger in the spring. And then about this time of year, after the native bees have nested and um, they're coming back out, the babies are coming back, then you can take all that out of your garden and uh, you've let nature's cycle uh, come through naturally. Um, oh, I've lost my... Um, so these are some uh, natural alternatives to pesticides. Ladybug, a ladybug can eat all these little aphids and you didn't have to do anything. There's all sorts of other ways that you can do things without using pesticides or toxic chemicals. So rethink your lawn, plant native plants, which we'll hear more about from Sephra, and don't use pesticides. And in Fairfield, we actually add one more thing to our pledge where we ask if you can try to add a water um, feature, which um, if you'll join us on Thursday afternoon with P Patrick Cummings, he talks a lot about landscaping for uh, wildlife. He talks about how that is so essential for um, bringing birds that won't come for any feeder, but they'll come for a water source. But you do need to be careful about um, making sure it's agitated so you don't get mosquitoes. So uh, this is again, a pesticide policy action alert. So we wanna ban, ban chlorpyrifos, we wanna end the pesticide preemption law, and we wanna restrict the use of PFAS. And if you wanna find out more and keep um, on top of things, you can sign up for alerts at the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters and there's their website, ctlcv.org. Um, you don't need a lot of space. If you have just a little space or you're a retailer, you can put a pollinator pathway garden right there in front of your uh, storefront. So uh, if you plant it, they will come. Um, one thing that's really important is you need a succession of blooms. You actually don't want to start in May. You want to start in March, even February. Um, and it, what's amazing to a lot of people is that um, uh, trees and shrubs are important, not just uh, perennials or even annuals. An oak will bring 534, will be a, a host plant of 534 caterpillars. So um, it's really important to think and all different layers of your, um, your garden. And this year we're working with Oliver Nurseries, Native Nursery Ganums and uh, the Wilton High School, which again, we'll hear more about later. They're going to be working to get uh, native plants and pollinator plants to you. So um, please get, get in touch with them and find out what they can provide for you. And again, leave the leaves. And uh, the Xerxes Society, it's easy for me to say, um, has all sorts of information on why that's so important for you. Here's our uh, monarch chomping away on a um, milkweed plant. They eat literally day and night, and that's a big monarch caterpillar He's about to turn into a chrysalis. They're a specialist. They, they only eat the milkweed plant. Um, so what's really exciting is that uh, something that Sephra is going to be talking about, the CT NOFA ecotype project that um, the Wilton High School team has already started with. Fairfield Ludlow and High School is also going to be working on that. Uh, we got a little bit of a hiccup because of where we are with our quarantine, but uh, we'll be coming, hopefully doing the same thing next year with, that Wilton is doing this year. Um, there's so many native bees. There's so many interesting different shapes and sizes that um, we'll be hearing more about that. So as time goes on, the pollinator pathway will tell you more and more about that. Here's something that's a really exciting uh, specialist. This is an evening primrose, and this is an evening primrose moth that climbs into the moth. I'm mean, sorry, the moth climbs into the uh, flower. And um, you can see that this white tip as it climbs in, you can't tell that it's this beautiful um, Fairfield colored, county colored uh, moth with this bright pink and bright green eyes. 
and it's a specialist. It lives and is designed to be within this plant. So there's all sorts of really fun stories about pollinators and plants, native plants. There's all sorts of citizen science things that you can do related to pollinators. The iNaturalist app is a really great one to download and learn more about. So the pollinator pathway is yours to explore. Look at this bee has all sorts of pollen right there on its uh, hind legs. It's really, it's on a, a pea family, probably a lupine flower. So um, feel free to explore. This looks like Randall's farm. Is that right, Mel? Yeah. It's yeah. So this is an Aspatec Land Trust uh, property. I, my, one of my favorite places to go in the fall, lots of ironweed and Joe pie weed. And that's a good segue to, for Mel to talk about the Green Corridor project. So I'm going to stop sharing and now I'll give it to Mel. Hello. Let's see. Oh, okay. That was quick. Well, I was a little over, so. Okay. No, no, that was quick that it popped up so quick. So um, thank you, Mary. That was great. And uh, um, uh, I'm Mary Ellen LeMay. I'm the Aspatuck Land Trust um, Director of Landowner Engagement. And um, I'm here to talk to you about the Green Corridor and how we're trying to engage homeowners in stewardship. And you'll find a lot of parallels um, to the pollinator pathway because this whole concept of pollinator pathways and green corridors um, kind of emerged from the same place, which is a a large conservation partnership called Hudson Housatonic. And um, we, uh, one of the first things that we did was begin to look at the large connected landscape of um, Connecticut and New York. And we saw all of these corridors and pathways across the state um, for wildlife, for recreation, for bird migration, and for watersheds, our Housatonic, our Saugatuck, our coastal watersheds um, all flow across the landscape. Um, but th our conservation partnership, this H2H, Hudson and Housatonic, um, realized that in the face of climate change, um, that the species are going to have to move up north across the landscape to get to places that are very resilient or green. Um, places that have diverse um, plant populations. And in order to do that, in order to get them to move across the landscape, we're gonna have to come up with the concept of giving them sidewalks, highways, corridors, pathways across the land. Um, and so that from that idea, the pollinator pathway emerged. Um, but at the same time, uh, some of these, uh, conservation partners like Aspatuck, we're looking at um, areas, specifically focus areas, where we could really um, measure and implement plantings of native plants to allow for this movement um, and up to the landscape. So this green corridor idea um, from the Aspatuck Land Trust, um, emerged, actually this, this whole corridor idea emerged before the pollinator pathways, but this now is um, kind of a focus area, a study area that Aspatuck Land Trust is doing. And, and the difference is between the pollinator pathway, the pollinator pathways are land stewardship. What we're throwing into the mix is land protection. So actually purchasing land um, like Trout Brook Valley up here, which is our biggest property, that will be protected in perpetuity. They will always be open space. Um, and this whole corridor is 40,000 acres. So we've kind of measured it um, to give a specific area where we can focus on to see if we do these three things, if we do plant natives, if we do avoid pesticides, if we do rethink our lawns, will we make a difference in biodiversity here? And that's exactly what we're trying to look at. Um, and so there's over six, there's six towns that this corridor overlaps. And this was, uh, this is the criteria that uh, the Aspatuck Land Trust used to come up with this corridor. So we looked at uh, habitats along uh, Wait, um, yeah 
has the, the screen? screen has the I think you have to share your screen Mel is it you're not oh. sharing did I get oh so I've done all this without you seeing slides yeah we're watching you that really stinks <laughs> That's okay. I go, I had my mess up. Now it's your turn. There we go. There we go. And then, okay, hold on. Oh, what a bummer. All right, let me go back then and share. There okay. she goes. Can you see it now? Yeah, now go in the slideshow. There you go. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to fly through here. I'm, I'm describing this beautiful corridor. Here's our, <laughs> here's our corridors uh, for wildlife, water, and recreation across the landscape. Um, and this is the green corridor, which is uh, 40,000 acres. Um, and it is the Aspetuck Land Trust region. And so the Aspetuck Land Trust, as you know, is um, the land trust for Fairfield, Weston, Easton, and Westport. Um, and that those this is the the four town area right here, but this green corridor goes above into Reading and into Wilton a bit. So this green corridor was developed using this criteria where we looked at preserved habitats along the Saugatuck River, along the Mill River. We looked at existing land trust properties, like here's um, uh, Trout Brook up here. We're trying to link habitats of rare flora and fauna, which are these circled areas where we have um, endangered species. Um, we want to avoid and mitigate effects of habitat fragmentation, which you see all here in these neighborhoods, and protect farmland soils. So Easton has a lot of really great farmland soils. So Easton is, is in this uh, green corridor. So when we overlay the green corridor over the pollinator pathways, each town has made a decision that the pollinator pathways are going to be town um, efforts. So the whole town of Fairfield's on the pollinator pathway, the whole town of Westport's on the pollinator pathway. Um, but the Aspetuck Green Corridor is a very specific 40,000 acres that overlays um, over those towns. So this gives you a good visual um, of the areas that we're talking about in the Green Corridor. Um, so again, the Green Corridor um, is a uh, major focus on private and public properties and open space protection. Um, and you have the same thing with the pollinator pathway, but um, it, it does not have the land protection part um, because Aspetuck is um, a land trust. So it's actually purchasing land to protect. Um, and so we both have three things that we can do that are similar, um, but our action steps for now are, are focusing on um, going into greater biodiversity, looking at uh, birds and mammals and protecting water. Um, and so these corridors and pathways are, are very much in alignment, but um, we're, we're, we've thrown into the mix the uh, land protection. So. When we look at, for example, our Trout Brook Valley, which is very uh, protected, it's uh, biodiverse. It has a lot of uh, geographic air, different geographic areas. It's got marsh, it's got ridge lines um, and forest, it's got swamp areas. And the more you have diverse landscape like this, this area has a higher capacity to host more species of birds and mammals and pollinators because of the shaping of the landscape. So this is where we want to have all of these species move to. And the only way they can move there across the landscape is if we create corridors, pathways and corridors. Um, we're trying to maintain connectivity to these sites to allow for species to naturally distribute themselves and keep this region resilient. Um, so when the uh, Regional Conservation Partnership in, in um, Connecticut uh, and New York started to look at data, we used this uh, New England forest cover data that looked at all of the states in New England and where we started off in 1600s 
up in the 90% forested range. And then through the 17 and 1800s, we just completely crashed as we deforested all of New England. And then the, the forest land began to restore itself, um, and which is a great thing. Uh, so the goal in New England is to keep 70% of the land forested. Right now, Connecticut's at 60% and we are declining because what we're doing is developing. Um, and this redevelopment is what you call a hard, hard deforestation. So um, it's not likely that land will re turn to forest as it did when it was agriculture. So in order to achieve this total 70% vision in New England, we have to increase our rates of conservation. And that's what the Aspatuck Land Trust is trying to do protect as much land as possible, but we can't protect all the land. So the second step and the important step that um, we're encouraging everyone to do now is to make their backyards part of this mix. And if we can protect our open spaces and connect them to our backyards, we can allow for movement across this green corridor. Um, from the Sound up into Redding, up into Trout Brook and farther north. Because when we look at this 40,000 acres of the Green Corridor, only 33% of it is protected. The rest of it is our backyards. So that's why it's so important for us to, to change the way that we manage our backyards. And we're basically following the recommendations of Dr. Doug Tallamy, um, whose uh, mission to bring nature back to our backyards with native plants is um, what we are sure is going to change the biodiversity um, crisis we're in uh, and turn it around for the better. So um, this is again a really good illustration of uh, you know two protected properties where wildlife and birds are trying to move across the landscape and they can't so they keep coming in circular fashions. If we connect our backyards, if we put native plants in our backyards, if we stop using pesticides, if we reduce our lawn, then the, the wildlife can move, the birds can move, the pollinators can move um, between these resilient landscapes. Um, and this is kind of a really good aerial shot of a, of a stepping stone because these homes, these homes that um, change the way they manage their backyard, these homes that plant native plants, uh, grasses, shrubs, trees, they become stepping stones on the landscape. So um, the traditional lawns provide nothing for um, wildlife. Um, and when they're sprayed with chemicals and pesticides, they become graveyards, not backyards. Um, so this, this shows really what we are encouraging people to do. Let's say this is a traditional backyard that's all lawn. And the more you add shrubs, the more you add native plants, the more you add trees, the more increase in diversity you'll see of species that show up. And ultimately you can have an entire healthy ecosystem in your backyard just by adding the right plants just by avoiding pesticide use. So more biological diversity equals more life. And this is Doug Tallamy's um, kind of web of life here, the circle of life by adding these native plants. That's the source for the energy that supports the insects. It's the source of energy for our herbivores. And that uh, connection to uh, our carnivores and all the other um, omnivores that live, share the backyards with us um, become much more balanced and we have um, a balanced ecosystem. So um, this again is um, Doug Tallamy's uh, Gardening for Life illustration, which I think is a really good one. And we want this in our backyards. If we don't add this, we won't have all of these beautiful birds. And if we won't have the birds, if we don't have the insects. So what we can do again, uh, this is completely reiterating what Mary said. Um, we're asking for three simple things, the pollinator pathway, the green corridor, it's all the same. There's no confusion. Plant native plants, rethink your lawn. That may mean adding clover. That may mean uh, letting some of the grass grow into a beautiful meadow and then avoid pesticides and herbicides. So what we're doing at the Aspatuck Land Trust to try and show people how to um, uh, 
increase biodiversity, um, we're doing demonstration sites. One of them is at Earth Place, which is in Westport. Um, this is a 2000 square foot um, area, uh, which is in the front, it was all lawn. So um, we engaged uh, Jay Petro uh, from Petro Gardens and um, his team came in. We worked together and, and removing the lawn, planting over 2000 um, native plants and 85% of those plants are natives. So um, this is just an example of some of what we planted in there. Um, we, it's just coming up now <clears throat> out of its winter dormancy and we're hoping to see a beautiful native garden there um, in front of Earth Place. And, and our major goal in addition to increasing biodiversity was to show people that native plants can be beautiful. They can be uh, formal. You can have a formal buttoned up garden that is native plants. Um, and the supply of the native plants has always been a challenge. Um, and this really exciting project that uh, Sefra is going to talk about is the um, Ecotype project. And uh, Connecticut NOFA um, is spearheading this. And um, this is the team of folks uh, at Gilberti's where we, we had one of our first meetings. There's Sefra and me and Dina from Connecticut NOFA. NOFA. And uh, so we're working together to see if we can establish native plant um, sites, collect the seeds, and then begin to grow the plants that we need to plant in the green corridor and in the pollinator pathway. Um, so the second thing, in addition to planting natives, is rethink your lawn. Um, uh, clover used to be always a part of seed, grass seed mixes that people could buy and up until World War II. After World War II, we started adding all of these broadleaf herbicides that killed the clover. Um, and by killing the clover, it reduced the nitrogen availability in the lawn. And then you had to buy nitrogen to put into the lawn. So if you reintegrate clover into your lawn, it increases nitrogen and you mulch mow, you won't need to put uh, fertilizer. And this lawn, I took this picture, um, at uh, the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. And I figured if, if uh, clover was good enough for the Pope, it was good enough for us. And this was beautiful because it was all clover. So these are options of rethinking your lawn. Um, and again, avoid pesticides. The sign just, I, you know, I can't believe we ever thought as a society, this was a good thing to have a sign like this on our front lawn. And it, it just came from all the pesticides that um, we've been sold since World War II, and it's completely turning our biodiversity upside down. So we want people to avoid this, avoid using these, and just get back to letting nature balance itself, not only for wildlife, but for our families and our pets. Um, aspatuck has been having a couple of uh, programs. We've launched this new series called Native Pairings. Um, which help people to learn about uh, lawns and um, native plants. Plant for the Queens, unfortunately, was canceled because of the coronavirus, but we should be up and running soon, I'm sure. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, getting the nature um, native pairings series back again. Um, so what we've rolled out for the Green Corridor is um, a green carter property sign. This is a, big, a square sign that goes on the mailbox post, very similar to the pollinator pathway signs. Um, and again, we want people to go on our website, sign this pledge that you're gonna do these three things. Um, and then we'll send you a sign to put on your mailbox. And uh, I'm looking for uh, mailbox posts that have both this sign and the pollinator pathway sign on it, because that is, that is the kind of home that is um, following the uh, three most important things you can do to increase biodiversity on their properties. So uh, too bad we can't get the wildlife and the insects to read these signs because this is what they were going to be looking for. Um, Doug Tallamy has a new book out. Um, we had him scheduled for May 5th uh, at the uh, Westport Library. Um, we're we're um, just kind of in a holding pattern with that. But if you go to our Aspatuck website, you'll see our events and uh, just stay tuned. Uh, we'll keep you apprised of um, uh, if uh, how we'll bring Doug back, maybe in person, maybe on a Zoom, um, but uh, stay tuned on that. 
We've also just launched a, a landscape partnership with these um, landscape designers, these native um, plant nurseries and some of our, um, our local nonprofits. Um, this is the team to call when you want to transform your property. Um, in Connecticut NOFA, uh, we've got lawn companies, um, we've got um, companies that are designing landscapes and managing them, and then we've got our native um, uh, um, nurseries as well. So in conclusion, as gardeners and stewards of our land, we've never been so empowered to help save biodiversity, and the need to do so has never been so great. All we need to do is plant native plants, and that's our friend Doug Tallamy. Um, so, and that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I would love to introduce you to Sephra Alexander, Alexander, who works for Connecticut NOFA and is going to talk to us about the um, native plants and the ecotype project. Uh, pleasure to be here and so excited to be working with you both. We like, like habitat community mosaics, we all are you know, doing the same work in fortifying these pathways. And I will work on sharing my screen. I think I can almost do it. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Oh, hold on. As I was telling them, I'm a trained in agricultural education, not technology. So here we go. <laughs> Okay, and let's see. Share screen. Where is it? Hmm. You get to click the blue button on the bottom right, the blue share button. Yep, it's you would think it would come up. Hold on. Let's try this again. Sorry, everybody out there. Okay, here we go. Zephyr's in the wilds of Vermont, so <laughs> also had the technical issues from that perspective as well. Let's see. How are we seeing anything yet? No. Okay. Um, share, present. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, it says it's here. Let's see. Share. Oh, wait. Did you just, I did I? There you go. Okay. Now you just want to go into slideshow. All right. Tell me if this works for you all. Let's see. There we go. Oh, you don't want to draw. You just want to go into slideshow. Wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it works so much better when we practice it. Um, just go into, I think, slide, right? Okay. Oops, what happened? I stopped sharing because let's see, I'm just trying to do this. Okay. Will you share? Okay, present. Do you want me to do do it, and you can tell me when to sh change? Because I've got it too. Oh, there you go. Sure, I can't see where the screen is. Um, can you all? Can you see what I'm looking at now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now just go right. to the show. Okay. Well, is that big enough for you to be able to see it? Yeah, but go into slideshow. I think it's view. I don't really know. Present. There you go. Okay. Don't worry, everyone. I can talk fast. So. Thank you, Kristen. Um, <laughs> all right. I am Sephra Alexandra. I call myself the seed huntress because for the past 10 years, I've been working in seed conservation um, all over the world. Seed conservation works with two main forms. You have ex situ conservation, which speaks to when seeds are taken out of where they're from naturally and stored in a cold storage, such as a seed bank, 
I'm a fellow for the Crop Trust. You may have heard of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, where we store a backup of the diversity of our world seeds. Um, the best form of conservation is in situ, which means in place. And so that's this concept of a living seed bank. When we have the seeds in our soils, they're able to continually be adapting to climates and uh, the, the changing climates and the changing pests and the changing pollinators needs. So really that is the ultimate of what we're trying to do. But in cases of man-made or natural disasters or with urban developments, when habitats are wiped out, we need to have a backup. So when I came back, CT NOFA, which is a wonderful organization, um, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, their mission is to ensure the growth and viability of organic agriculture, organic food and organic land care in Connecticut to envision a healthy organic Connecticut founded on ecologically, socially and economically just principles. Um, they asked me to start a pollinator health initiative. Now, NOFA spans across seven chapters. It's been around for about 40 years and it really promotes education um, of farmers advocacy for healthy food systems. So under a USDA specialty crop block, grant, crop block grant, we are able to launch this pollinator health initiative. What is the correlation between pollinators and on-farm yields? Well, if you don't have pollinators on your farm, you're not going to have any produce produced. So really the impetus to start this ecotype project was an understanding of getting pollinator habitat onto these farms. Um, and when we were looking at establishing this, we come to this beautiful map that you see here. So the EPA a while back put out these eco regional maps. Now what an eco region is, if you look instead of man made delineations of this is Connecticut, this is Massachusetts, this is New York, what it does, as we've been talking about today, is goes along ecological corridors and says, paints these habitat mosaics based on soil structure, hydrology, geology, all of the different data points that you look at in conservation and restoration. And they lay them on top of each other like a layer cake. And they say, anything along eco region 59, which is what we are in, any genetics that you take from plants within those areas, you can replant along those corridors and our native pollinators will be happy. Just like humans, we steward and caretake heirlooms that we think taste good and do well in our area, in our terroir. Our local pollinator friends are doing the same things. So when you collect those local genetics, that's what we call an ecotype. Now, there's a lot of conversation because I think this community has started to understand the importance of planting natives. Um, just like has been said before, and as Doug Tallamy has said, when we plant a native oak, for example, that's host to hundreds of different caterpillar species, which is then food for our songbirds for their young and helps facilitate our whole health of our ecological web. So native ours are when there are the cultivars of native plants. They've been selected because they do well, they look good, they're reliable and they're uniform. Um, this is oftentimes what's sold in the horticultural trade. Now, these are great for our pollinators. Um, and certainly with our whole point of the Ecotype Project, we don't want perfect to be the enemy of good. So if you have these in your backyard, that's excellent. The thing about native ours versus ecotypes are, native ours, they're usually planted by vegetative propagation, it means you take cuttings and you replant it, which means they all have a, a monocultural or a similar genetic um, similar, excuse me for a second, um, welcome to Vermont, a similar genetic um, uniformality. So the problem with that is, and the why we want ecotypes, which are those local genotypes, those local wild kinetic, gen wild collected genetics, is because we want to promote that vigor, that adaptation. When you have that variation of genetics in your seeds, then they're able to adapt to whatever your soil structure, climate, or environment may may demand with the, with the changing circumstances. So really ecotypes um, for these wild habitat restorations are your best bet, but the problem is, is they're not readily available. So um, to put that conversation in your mind, now let's think quickly. As this wonderful woman, she was from the South, she said, when you invite house guests over and you tell them to stay at your house for a week, she says, well, you can't just feed them on Monday, y'all. 
So if you think about it, um, we can't just be feeding our pollinators in May or certain times of the year. We need to make sure we have things on our landscape in different variety that bloom all throughout different times of the year. And also not just at one trophic layer, meaning just like um, a monocultural annual garden versus planting a perennial edible forest, you wanna make sure that you have ground covers, that you have shrubs, you have trees because different pollinators have different requirements for their nesting habitat, their feeding habitat, um, and for their host plant habitat. So these are two great resources that I have here from uh, Kim Stoner that tell you different native trees and shrubs and flowers that fulfill those different bloom times to have nectar and pollen available all throughout the year. So from the ecotype project perspective, where do we begin? Well, we started with these eight uh, these eight species to begin with. Granted, as we move forward with this project, we want to diversify more to different types of habitat, to shrubs and trees, but this is where we've started. So the Eupatorium, the Joe Pie weed, is a great, not only um, specialist host plant to the tiger swallowtail, but also a generalist to a bunch of different pollinators. And um, I have to say, we'll talk about this later, the seed production off of it is just magnificent. The New York ironweed as well is host to a number of native bees. As been mentioned, there's hundreds of different native bees. So what we talk about is the more diversity we have on our landscape, the more diversity of pollinators we'll be able to host. That's because like the pollen tubes, for example, if you think about the, the Lepidoptera's little tongues that go in, they're different lengths and different sizes for different species. So when you have different plants, your different pollinators are able to access that pollen. So, from this list, what we did with our Joe Pye weed and our New York ironweed, some narrow leaf mountain mint and um, some of the uh, Monarda, just the wild bergamot, just to name a few, we found botanists who actually could go out and collect this wild seed. Because the issue with collecting wild seed is you have to be very informed about which areas haven't been disturbed, which areas actually have true stands of native wild ecotypes, which takes a lot of identification and going through floras, which takes quite a lot of expertise. It's like learning a different language. Um, so we've been working with Jordi Elkins, who understands the different protocols of a sustainable amount of seed to harvest, where you harvest, when you harvest, what it's ripe, um, when it's ripe, and so forth. So we work with the botanist who take this wild collected seed, and then we find organic farms to plant them out as our founder plots. The, this past season, we worked with um, three different founder plots. Um, namely, our, our largest one was at the hickories. We had eight different species there. So this is the first time that wild collected ecotype seed has been locally grown on organic farms. So of the hickories, eight species, the Joe Pye weed and the New York ironweed produced a prolific, um, almost half a million seed. And I'll show you a picture of that next. Um, so what we do then is as the seed crop matures, we go through and then we collect this seed and we clean it, which is quite a fun endeavor. I must say, you have to be like a detective. You have to figure out the different plants needs, their seed sizes, which sieves do you use? Um, and you clean it away from its, um, it's basically, it's pappus. Like when you see dandelion seeds floating in the wind, that's how seeds get spread from the wind. It's called animochery. Seeds have a number of dispersal methods, but most wild seed spreads by wind dispersal because with half a million seeds, you need to get away from your mother plants to have the best opportunity to keep growing. So after we did this seed cleaning, what we do then is we get it to the nursery growers so that they're able to propagate these native plants from seeds. So now these are organic ecotype seeds that they're propagating. We want them to do this so that we can make this available to you all, to the gardeners, to landscapers, to all the wonderful people who participate in the pollinator pathways. Um, we want the right plants in the right place for the right pollinators. And for the Aspatuck Land Trust, for these huge restoration sites. So basically the, uh, basically the market is endless. And what we're trying to do is fortify this pathway so that we actually have um, access and availability for everyone who needs it to the actual proper genotypes and genetics that's really doing the restoration, conservation, and pollinator habitat work 
that we are all talking about here. So whether it's container gardens, pollinator gardens at home, demonstration sites from the land trust, or really exciting is working with the Department of Transportation because um, I need to finish up here because we have questions, but the Department of Transportation has a law that says anytime native seed is available, they need to use it um, so that we can uh, have these huge swaths of lands be able to host our local pollinators. So hopefully as we get more founder plots, work on getting better equipment to clean our seeds and have better, have more partners, we can have huge, very large volumes of seed quickly to be doing this work at a larger scale. So our stakeholders are all here. Um, this is really exciting because it brings everyone to the table and says that we all have a part to play in doing this restoration work. And um, it's been wonderful to work with everyone on this call and wonderful people all throughout the area, especially up in the right hand corner, you can see um, Jim Hunter and Brett Gilman of Wilton High School. And they are working on high school protocols with, with Mary Hogue. We've also been approaching a bunch of the Fairfield schools and a bunch of the other towns, Easton and so forth. And with these protocols, we'll really be having the high school kids get involved with the propagation so that they can um, learn how to stratify and germinate these native seeds so we can have them available for um, the residential and commercial uses as well. So here you can see how you can stay in touch with us, how you can help support the great work of the Ecotype Project, those that are collecting and growing and cleaning the different seeds. Um, so that we can make it all available as well as the Wilton High School Garden Club has the first ecotype plant sale. There's a link there and orders are due by May 1st and they'll be COVID correct curbside pickup at the Hickories. So my information is there and um, I hope to be in touch with you all and help to keep growing this project. So now with the time we have left, we would love to take any questions from anyone out there. Thanks so much. Uh, I I just wanted to say um, we are going to give all, all put all these presentations up on the website. So and the links are live in the presentations. So we rushed a little bit at the end there because we wanted to make sure that there were questions. But Jean's saying there aren't any questions. I'm looking to see who's on the call. It looks like a lot of very um, knowledgeable people. So um, feel free to you know take your time and think about what you might want to ask. I think I think that maybe we can just have a conversation until something arises. I think um, something that's been so important about doing this work is understanding like what what it means to fortify a, a regional ecological model of restoration and conservation. I think once we get, as I showed that last slide quickly, the land trust and the scientists, the botanists, the farmers, and we can show that we can create these more closed loop systems that within each eco region, we can have those that are collecting, growing, saving, implementing these different facets of what it takes to really have robust native habitat available to be supporting all of the pollinators along these corridors. So I think it's really exciting, the three of us, how we all are holding different space, but it's really all fortifying the same corridor conservation or con con conversation around conservation. <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> and I'm fast. Um, yeah, one of the things we do in Fairfield that started a while ago, um, which was more for veggie gardening, is uh, a seed library in our Fairfield Woods Library. Uh, so uh, Fairfield's kind of been in that whole sort of uh, seed saving, seed sharing concept for a while. Um, so can't get to that right now because you can't get to the library physically, but um, it's something that, you know, we should probably consider expanding the seed library there to be not just the veggies, but also these uh, native seeds as well. Cause I think people would be interested in that. Yeah, I started a seed library at the Pequot Library because I've been reviving a local allium heirloom, the Southport Globe Onion. And now that there's um, COVID restrictions, they have a free lending library outside where we can have seeds. But I think you're right, you know, once we're able to have more of these seeds available, just giving them out to anyone who wants to be planting them. You know, I have a lot of friends, seeds should be free and cannot be owned. So we just, I've, I've spent this past year with all the ecotype seed, giving it out to anyone who wants it and um, wants to implement it yeah. on their land. I think my brother had a question. Mm. 
where can seeds harvested be shared amongst the local community in Fairfield County? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we think we just answered that. Yeah. <laughs> and they can um, email me for some seeds. It has to be stratified, which is interesting, but. What does that mean? Why don't you talk about that? Cause that's a new concept for people. People think you just put the seed in the ground and off you go. Yeah, sure. So when we think about it, you know, a lot of our annuals that we have in our vegetable gardens, um, those are kind of bred to just put them in and they grow and they go for that season. But if we think about our wild native plants, what we have to think about is we're trying to mimic the natural ecosystems. So what happens out in nature? The seeds blow off from the plants, they fall to the ground, then they sit in the mud from snow, frost, rain, thaw, warm, cold. They go through all these different variations, which helps break um, that seed coat to make it be able to germinate because different seeds require different temperatures, which is called stratification, how you stratify it, to be able to actually grow. And so oftentimes we have to put our native seeds, either direct winter sow them and leave them out in the environment in a milk jug or something, or put them in a, a bit of wet sand and put them in the freezer or the fridge for a bit of time to break their dormancy or when seeds are asleep. So it's fun and every species is different. And that's another part of the, the adventure of native plants, native seeds. Well, Sephra, thank you so much. We actually have a question right now. Uh, people are very excited about having placed their orders with the, um, Wilton High School and pick up for pickup on May 16th. And the question is, will they be able to get advice on how to plant the plants that they purchase? Um, yes, so we are creating uh, planting protocols, not only for farmers, but for the residential, the residential sector as well. And so um, by time that they pick up their plants, that wonderful website that the Wilton High School has made that has all the different species lists on it, will also have planting guidelines. And hopefully we'll have a little plant pamphlet as well when you pick up your plants. But um, certainly that resource will be available on the, the High School Garden Club website. Thanks, Sephra. Um, and I just wanted to, for the folks in Fairfield, and I think other places in um, not just Fairfield and Wilton, they're going to be trying to replicate what they did in Wilton with Jim Hunter, with other teachers in other towns to be able to have students learn how to do the same kind of propagation and uh, citizen science kind of thing. So what that's what I think is so exciting is it give these kids a chance to do some science data collection, as well as propagate these seeds and be part of this whole movement to grow these native plants and this whole new industry. So pretty cool stuff. So it's exciting. Yeah, so it's it, great. And, yeah, and we'll have those high school protocols available on the website as well, which will be great. So if other towns have high schools, and is it, and is it just high schools? Because I think I had gotten a question from somebody who had middle school um, science kids that wanted to do that. Does it matter? No, certainly not. I think as long as we can um, get the plant started, I think I, the great thing about nature place based education is once you're working with a curriculum, you can really adapt it to whatever you're trying to teach. It's a great way to teach about entomology and ecology and um, you know, pollination and production. And so um, I think it's great for all grades. It's just a matter of just making sure you have the facilities and the place to get the plant started. So what facilities, do they need a greenhouse or can they just do it on a windowsill or? I think a windowsill would work. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. they should contact- sure wants to live. That's what I say. <laughs> so they should contact you to get started on that in their schools? Um, yep, certainly my, I have um, an email on there and as it progresses, obviously for this season, it's a little bit waylaid because right. of the quarantine, but certainly if they get in contact with me, it's sephra at ctnofa.org. We can put them on a list and whenever new information or resources comes out for educators and in school implementation, we can let them know. Okay. Do we have any more questions, Jean? No, we are all set. No more questions. If people do have questions, now would be a good time to pop them right in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll wait for that for about a minute, but right now we are, we're good to go. So, so um, Mel and Sephra and I have one last thing we were going to share with you. Are, are you guys ready? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
Okay, one and a two and. Get your seats. Get your seats. You gotta have fun when you go. You know? <laughs> Plant seeds and stay safe, everybody. <laughs> All right, have fun. Bye. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mel. Great, thank you. All right. Bye bye.